Greetings and welcome to At Macaulay Author Series featuring Dr. Charles Lee. My name is Charmaine Hill, and on behalf of Dean Valdez and our entire Macaulay community, we would like to thank you for joining us this first day of fall. I just have one update um, for this program. Dr. Karen Masters, who's also one of the co-authors, is under the weather and will not be able to join us this evening. But I'm sure Dr. Lou and Alan will discuss Dr. Masters' contributions to the book. So recently there has been a lot of news around space travel and this ties really well with our program tonight. So it's a great pleasure to introduce Dr. Charles Liu and Alan Liu um, discussing 30 seconds space travel. And Dr. Liu will also talk about his recent children's book, Intro to Physics for Babies. So right now, it's a pleasure to introduce Dr. Charles Liu, who is a professor of physics and astronomy at the City University of New York's College of Staten Island and an associate in astrophysics with the American Museum of Natural History and Hayden Planetarium. His research focuses on colliding galaxies, supermassive black holes and the star formation history of the universe. Dr. Liu served as the Macaulay Honors Director for six years at the College of Staten Island campus, and I'm so happy to have him here tonight. Joining him is co-author Alan Liu. Alan Liu is a science writer and, communita, and communicator based in New Jersey. Alan earned his AB in mathematics from Harvard, where he studied geometric shapes called polytopes in up to four dimensions. Alan has been interested in space and space travel from a young age. He founded an astronomy club at age 14, operated the Loomis Michael Observatory at Harvard, and has spent nearly 1,000 hours studying the intricacies of orbital mechanics in the physics simulation game Kerbal Space Program. Outside of academics, his interests include singing, fiction writing, and amateur radio, in which he holds a general class ham license, which is awesome. And moderating the discussion tonight is Ann Wong, class of 2023. Ann is a junior at Macaulay Honors College at Queens College, double majoring in media and film studies and minoring in business and liberal arts, also known as BALA. She is currently the senior intern at Macaulay's Office of Care Career Development, and she aspires to pursue a career in media law and explore various opportunities within both the media and the law industries. I'd like to thank them all for being here with us tonight, and I cannot wait to hear the program. Thank you for the great introduction, Charmaine, and thank you, Dr. Liu and Alan, for being with us tonight. So without further ado, I'll go ahead and get started. Um, I would just like to follow up a little bit more on kind of the backgrounds for Dr. Liu and Alan. And Dr. Liu, I'm interested, how did you first get your start in the field of physics and astronomy? Oh, well, I was just this little kid and I like to drop things and throw things. That's how you get your start in physics and astronomy. And then that's in-, in answer. Yeah, That's all it is. And, and then as a kid, my first significant purchase with like my own money, you know, which you get like a little things was a telescope, uh, a little tiny backyard telescope, which cost $101 and 62 cents, which, you know, since I'm an old fart, um, translates today to like $45 million or something like that. Right. But it was super cool and I really loved it. And I didn't use it very well. I, I was not like deeply involved. I couldn't do a whole lot, but I just really liked having that telescope. And then over the years, my parents who were very sweet, who like wanted me to be a doctor, said, you know what, we want you to be a doctor, but if you want to go do like stuff like science, go ahead, it, it'll be all right. And it did. That's how I got my study. That's wonderful. And I love how you remember the price down to the exact cent that it costs. Um, and for Alan, uh, I, you know, I noticed that you majored in mathematics at Harvard, uh, but you also mentioned simultaneously that in addition to math, you also had great interest in space and travel. So I'm wondering how did you get your interest you know, in space and travel and what made you decide to pursue a major in the mathematics instead of one in the sciences? Yeah, so I, I think, what's the car horn? Sorry, I'm very easily distractible. <laughs> uh, yeah, so uh, very much when I was younger, I was, sort of involved in immersed in going to these astronomical conferences because my father is, sort of took me there and I just was always really entranced by the kinds of things that people were doing, the research about the entirety of this 
vast, vast universe and the space travel of us being able to explore that. I think part of the reason that I went to mathematics just because it has this flexibility, I guess, where you can use it in so many different branches of the sciences and you know, physics and chemistry and social sciences. And I think that sort of being able to understand the tools that we use to understand the universe themselves was what interested me the most. Yeah, that's really interesting. And I think it also goes to show how you know, your major kind of can take you in many different directions. You're not really bound necessarily to something specifically only related to mathematics, which kind of takes us into, you know, the creation of this book. Um, I'm interested for Dr. Lewin Allen, you know, what inspired you to write this book? And yes, 30 seconds of space travel. And how did you go about working on it with your fellow co-authors? I know Dr. Masters uh, unfortunately couldn't join us today, but I'm sure she also took part in the way the book came about. And so, you know, I understand for this book specifically, uh, this is the second book that you've co-written with Dr. Masters for Dr. Liu. And, you know, I'm just really interested in the creation process. Was there like a mutual interest and how, how did everyone come together to decide to work on this project? Uh -huh. Well, it goes something like this. Um, every once in a while, publishers will actually come to you and say, we have a book that we need an author for. Would you be willing to be an author or would you be willing to suggest people who could be an author? And so what happened was in this instance, you know, I've gone from like lots of different books. So my, the first big book I, you know, is, is like big, it's like coffee table book, right? And then you see that the 30 second space travel is like a medium sized book. Uh, and then now I have this little tiny book for kids. So it's like a variation of different varieties of, of my, I, perhaps it's a description of like my life heading down and down into the little kitty place. I don't know. But uh, the story is that a publisher came to me and said, hey, we have this 30 second series. They have 30 second chemistry, 30 second philosophy, 30 second uh, probability. Wine. 30 second, what was that? Wine. That's, That's right, wine, they have 30 second yeah. wine. Yeah, so this is a long-standing series, and they wanted to create a book about uh, the universe, a 30-second book about the universe. And um, that was very interesting, but their model was such that they would get a lot of people, sometimes between five and 10 authors, they would write a few topics each, and then they'd stick them together in sort of a compendium that had a, an editor that sort of pulled it all together, some sort of contributing editor. Uh, I... Um, originally said, okay, I'll write a couple of articles for this. But then uh, the publisher called me back and said, oh, uh, guess what? The contributing editor had to drop out because of a different thing, the time commitment thing. So would you be willing to be contributing editor? And I thought about it and I said, I, I am not, but I am willing to be a co-author if we can get people. Because you see in science, we don't have the sort of uh, same style of writing. Everybody is a co-author and people contribute to it at different levels or at different uh, pieces. But in the end, everyone is equally responsible for uh, being an author on, on the work. And I said, so if I could be a co-author, that would be okay. Uh, and they said, oh, well, great. Um, well, can you get seven or eight co-authors? Uh, I said, no, but I can get three. Uh, you know, no, three would be fine, right? And they were hemming and hawing because they, they hadn't done this particular model before. They just planned to list an editor and then a bunch of contributors and things like that. And I said, no, let's, let's turn through this way. So, so they went for that, decided to, to be a little flexible and they did, we did 30 second universe. So I needed to find two authors, uh, friends of mine. Of course, I only want to work with like fun people. Uh, I will work with unfun people if I have to, but I, I have to, I want to only work with fun people. And so uh, two of my friends who also uh, top-notch scientists, like world-leading type scientists. Uh, I worked with them. One is uh, Karen Masters, uh, who is at Haverford College. She runs uh, the uh, what's well, a significant uh, piece of the administration of the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, which is one of the world's largest astrophysical collaborations. Uh, and she's also a project scientist for the Zooniverse Galaxy Zoo Project, uh, one of the first citizen science programs in the country, in the world. Um, so she said she could write some of it. And then I uh, asked uh, Professor Seville Salur for this 30 second universe book. She um, is a particle physicist. So she worked at CERN and talks about these 
quarks and Higgs bosons and things like that. And so she wrote that part of the book and that was called 32nd Universe. And that book came out a couple of years ago and the um, publishers decided it was a good idea to go further and say, hey, how about we do a 32nd space travel book too? Because they wanted that. And I said, okay. Um, but uh, Seville, the particle physicist, uh, wasn't a real space travel buff type person. And so we had to find another author. Uh, originally, we thought maybe just Karen and I would just write the two of them together, but uh, we realized we wanted someone with greater expertise, specifically in the modern space travel stuff. And, and that's where uh, Alan came in. Uh, so Alan can pick up the rest of this story from here, how we wound up having this third author, Alan, on there. Yeah, I mean, I don't know exactly all the, the how much more of the story there is. Um, yeah, That's the most so, yeah. important part. Okay, so yeah, so I um, joined up with this project, um, and the in terms of the actual writing and the collaboration of the book, we have it set up so that we each selected out um, some of the various topics of the book. Like we said, it's broken up into these fifty-seven or so topics. Um, and so what happened was each of us, we selected which ones we want to do and we would coordinate with each other so that we could reference one another's topics so that we can say this to that, this connected to that, so you can read the book linearly, but you can also jump from idea to idea. And so we wrote this, I, most of what I did was over the summer of 2019, um, but I continued doing a few things in addition after that. Um, and then the publishers did their publishing magic and now the book exists. That's wonderful. And you bring up a great point, which is how there were different uh, topics and concepts within this book specifically. And you each got to pick some of the topics you would like to work on. And so, you know, given the book highlights the most essential concepts and topics, you know, within the space and travel field, I'm interested in learning how did you guys go about picking which concepts and topics you would want to include? Because I'm sure there were a lot and maybe um, more than you were able to include. So what made you decide, hey, I'm gonna pick this one and put it within this topic instead of another topic? Yeah, so one of the things that um, we ended up going with was, um, we have some of the book is chronological. So especially the sections about the space race, um, which is the, you know, the very early period of space travel coming from Sputnik, the launch of the first satellite in the end of the 50s through to the Apollo moon landings and a little bit beyond. That we sort of cover chronologically-ish. Um, but a lot of what we do in the book, a lot of what we select is, is taking these sort of more conceptual ideas, things like where do you want to even put a spaceport? Um, or what kinds of rockets could we make beyond the ordinary chemical explodey kinds that we usually like to use. Um, and in taking those sort of ideas where you can get a sense of how space travel works, not just what we have done with it. And we've put those into these, into these sections. So I, I could go into the specific sections where we talk about the physics of space travel, we talk about the mechanics of space travel, we talk about the space race, we talk about some of the destinations for space travel, and we talk about the future of space travel. Um, and so we have these sections and, and it was, yeah, so it, it was, it was some, there was discussion about what to go in, but this, the idea is we wanted to make sure that the reader would get an overview both of the history and of the why and the how we actually can get to space. You can sort of think about creating the topics in the book as sort of a narrative, right? Every book is a story. What's the story we wanted to tell about space travel? So we tell about, well, how did it start? And then what happened? And then what happened? Okay, so now we're here today. What are we thinking about when we want to go to space? Where should we go? And then what about stuff we don't know yet? Where are we going next? So it's an arc that even though it's a nonfiction book, even though it's divided into small groups, the goal is to tell a story. And that's true for everyone who's writing any kind of thing, even if it's a, a scientific paper. Uh, the, the research that you know, we do, for example, uh, we want the reader to get the story 
And we may not use the same style of prose. We may not use the same uh, methods or, or techniques of storytelling, but in the end, it is still a narrative that we want to jump off the page and make everybody be happy with. That's a really wonderful explanation. And I think it helps a lot of us who maybe don't necessarily write a lot of scientific or nonfiction works to understand that even within you know, your science papers and your science uh, publications, a lot of the times they do still follow a narrative to make it conceptually easier to follow along with. And it's not just a lot of science facts being thrown at you. And kind of along the topics of the way that the book was created, I know Alan, you had briefly mentioned you started working on this project in 2019 and the book was published earlier this year in March. And I'm wondering whether the pandemic influenced the production or publication of the book, you know, in any way or just were there any other obstacles that you may have faced along the way? And how did you guys kind of navigate that and go about handling the situation? Yeah, so there was the publishing house um, did have some, they had to furlough some of their staff um, during the early phases of the pandemic. So that tangibly affected some of the process of getting things edited and getting things sort of out the door that last bit. Um, I think that one of the nice things about the way that we set this up was that it, a lot of the work that we were doing would have been remote anyway. So uh, well, sort of the things after the main bulk of the text was written, we had to do things like review um, illustrations that were sent in um, and to look at sort of the surrounding texts, um, describing those illustrations or describing little bits about sort of adding bonus flair and flavor to the actual text that we've written. Um, and so I think it was, there were challenges and I think the pandemic definitely was one of those challenges, um, but I think that it, it didn't, it, it was very smooth as far as one could expect it to go. Uh, Dr. Liu, did you have any challenges along the way as well, or was it also mainly what uh, Alan had covered? Alan is exactly right. Uh, <laughs> that's basically what happened. The original plan was for the book to come out in late 2020, in case people wanted to use them as stocking stuffers or something like that. But uh, the delay at the press basically pushed it several months. And so uh, it was decided to launch it in the spring of 2021 instead. And so aside from that, the process was very similar to other books that I've done in the past, 30 Second Universe, for example. And Alan is exactly right also when uh, the idea that after you've written it, you're done is not true for many books, including this one. Because then we had to say, hey, can you give us figure captions? Uh, can you make sure that this is correct? That's correct. Could you add a glossary? Could you add an index? Could you add a biography? So there was a lot more happening toward the end, even though uh, the original text was delivered um, plenty early and plenty of time for, for all that to happen. So that's all. We are very lucky uh, that in this case, in our book, uh, everything could be done remotely. So delays, yes, but overall production of the book, we had already gotten most of it done before the pandemic and it was remote anyway, so we were okay. I'm really glad to hear that the process was relatively smooth uh, with exceptions for the delay. And that brings us to you know, the actual publication of the book, which is a couple of months ago. And I'm wondering, you know, what impacts do each of you hope that this book will have on the scientific community and even beyond the scientific community for, individuals who let's say may walk into a bookstore but maybe they gravitate towards fiction books and not science books as their first choice of picking up is there like a general message um, you are hoping that people will receive from this book well well let me sort of bring the overall 30 second idea to the table and and then alan can sort of give a, a deeper uh, dive into that point 
it is very hard to read a book from beginning to end. It, it just is. For me, especially, I've probably re read what? Seven books cover to cover in the past 20 years. Yeah, you know, I mean, some people are really good at it. I suck at it. Uh, but overall, what can we get people excited about and have fun for? If you leave a book on the table and they feel comfortable with picking it up, looking at something and going, oh, that's kind of cool. I'll take a look, you know, and then you spend uh, technically 30 seconds, but really probably a few minutes, right, on a topic and think about it and learn about it, then you've learned something and it's kind of cool. Uh, so the entire 30 second premise is one that attracts me very much. I'm not creating any deep new discovery or sending out bold new controversial hypotheses or anything like that. In this particular book, um, what I'm doing is to give people that comfort level and make them cheerful and make them uh, satisfy their curiosity in a way that, that makes them happy. It just happens the topic is, is space travel in this case, but it could be anything. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll leave my bold new hypotheses for my research papers. This is just as cool because I probably reach more people. Probably a lot more people read uh, this book or than they would read my research papers, uh, but it's for different purposes. Yeah, one of the goals that I sort of would come in with this specific space travel book is that there's there's a lot of news about space travel recently because of you know people like the various billionaires with their space programs and NASA's plans to go back to the moon, China and India, and Japan and all these other great countries coming out with their own new satellites and probes to various places. And I think what I would like for this book to say is for people who might be, have read some of this or have seen some of this in the background, be like, I'm a little bit curious about what space travel is actually like. What are the kinds of things you have to do to put a satellite in orbit to send something to Mars? And they can come in and see this book and be like, oh, you know, come out more knowledge, come out with more excitement for the really, really cool stuff that's going on in the space travel realm today. That's wonderful. I think definitely like what Dr. Liu had mentioned, um, it's very hard to read a book cover to cover, especially you know, if you're very busy and you know the book is very in depth and it's detailed, you go from you know, if it's page one to page 400, you can't really miss too many pages in between because it would be quite difficult to understand the entirety of what is happening. But definitely with this book, at least when I was looking through it, I noticed how, you know, each chapter, or each um, subtopic is broken up where, you know, if I go from page one to like page 12, I can kind of just glimpse through it and see what is this topic about and get a good understanding without feeling like, oh, I missed too many pages in between. And so going off on uh, what Alan had mentioned about, you know, the current space travel and, you know, most recently SpaceX successfully uh, landed uh, their, you know, their uh, spaceship into orbit and then they were able to come back down successfully. So what are some of your thoughts on that for both Dr. Wu and Alan? And I know that, uh, Alan, you're very knowledgeable on this field. So if there's anything you can enlighten us with, uh, please do so. Yeah, so SpaceX um, is Elon Musk's space company, as people probably have heard. Um, and they are a very exciting company in a lot of ways um, because of the way that they're making space travel transition from being something solely run by big government agencies to becoming something that's run by private companies and even individuals. Um, so company, uh, Organizations like NASA have always used private companies. They would use military contractors primarily in the early days of the Apollo program when we first made it to the moon and so forth. So the same manufacturers that would make military jets um, would make rocket stages and pieces of engines for NASA to use. Um, but they've sort of transitioned in the past few years, in the past couple of decades, I guess, to this model of hiring private companies like Boeing and like SpaceX and like um, some smaller companies as well to create their own spaceships from scratch um, and send them to NASA created assets like the International Space Station. So SpaceX's newest mission, um, Inspiration4 it was called, um, sent four just 
ordinary people who had a few months of astronaut training but weren't professional astronauts um, to orbit the Earth. So they would circle the Earth for a few days um, and then splash back down in the ocean. And what's cool about these people is that they're yeah, the, none of none of them are professional astronauts. I mean, there were there was people who did some military test pilot uh, training. There was, but there was also a bone cancer survivor who's a physician's assistant, um, who was there as part of a fundraiser for St. Jude Children's Hospital. Um, there was a dude who won a raffle. There was someone who won a business pitching idea competition. Um, so the idea is that you don't have to be either the best of the best professional astronaut material or the richest of the rich billionaires to actually rig into space. You can be someone like the average person off the street who's just interested in this kind of thing. And you know, now it's only if people if you're if you're either rich or lucky. Um, but someday, maybe a few decades from now, it'll be just anyone who wants to go or has a good reason to get up to get up into out, out of the earth and into the universe. Yeah, the the technology is what excites me if you think about this. The and and uh, Alan can definitely talk more about that as far as inspiration for and the Falcon launch systems and things like that. Um, but if you have to realize just in my lifetime, how far the technology has gone. The computer that was on the Apollo landing module, the thing that actually got Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin and everybody else onto the surface of the moon and back, the computer was about the size of a car engine and it had ropes of coiled uh, electronics in them this big, huge thing, like the like a size of a and a weight of a room air conditioner, and its computing power is less than one millionth of a current iPhone. So, using that in comparison to what is today is the stuff that really excites me about modern technology and science. I, I don't even think that the Inspiration Four crew that went up last week and came back down this weekend. Uh, even needed to push a button. Is that right, Alan? Yeah, I think the idea was that the mission should be able to run entirely by itself, um, just with the onboard computers and the people on the on the ground. Like you can just ride it as a passenger. Yeah, that's very interesting. And this whole new concept or whole new possibility of there just being, you know, passenger flights into space. Um, and even just you know a couple months back when Blue Origins went up into space, they also had you know the one of the youngest passengers who was 18 at the time, and his dad was able to just sponsor him a trip into space. And so I'm wondering, Dr. Liu and Alan, what are your thoughts on this possibility of more future passenger flights into space, where we don't have astronauts going up there for necessarily research purposes, but maybe just you know, like Alan mentioned, either you're really rich or you're just really lucky and you decide that you wanted to go see Earth from many, many, many miles um, above. So what are your thoughts on that? I'm really excited by it. I think that at first it's going to be the adventure seekers. Um, so the people who want to be in space because space is awesome and I think it is awesome. Um, but I think after that, the next wave is going to be really interesting. It's going to be the people who are going up to space for their jobs, where that job isn't, I'm an astronaut. That job is, I'm part of someone working on maybe developing 3D printing organs in space, or someone who is part of an asteroid mining organization, or someone who is running a fueled propellant depot for other satellites. Um, it's the, the idea is that our economy and our industry can move from Earth to space um, or expand from Earth to space. And, you know, a lot of the technologies that are being pioneered now, like companies like Blue Origin and SpaceX, where they're reusing the same rockets many times, or where they're creating these gigantic rockets that are capable of, of, of lofting more material to space than ever before um, and bringing things back down safely too, that those are going to enable 
the that next next wave of people in space. And that I think is going to be the part where it gets even more interesting than it already is. Yeah. I'm curious how long that's likely to take. Uh, if you look back in the history of say aviation, right, as, as late as 1902, uh, very senior scientists and authorities were sure that humans could never create their own airplanes, right? But then in 1903, the Wright brothers did it uh, only for a few seconds, but it happened. And it wasn't until about what, 1940 or so, 1940s, that a lot of people were regularly going up in airplanes and coming back down. And it wasn't until the 60s or 70s that people were regularly on airplanes traveling all over the world uh, in a relatively safe way, right? Where you had only a few aviation disasters and accidents in any given year. Uh, so I think it's about a 50 year cycle maybe that we're gonna wind up with from now being the first few civilians going up into where we're all just using it as transportation. Uh, Alan was telling me about some sort of suborbital thing where instead of taking a, uh, the better part of a day to travel from one coast to the other in the United States or you know, taking more than a, an entire day to fly all the way, say, to Asia from New York, uh, you're going to do it, what, in, in 40 minutes or something? Yeah, so that's, that's one of SpaceX's various proposals is that they want to use their, their space launch vehicles as ground-to-ground -ground transport um, uh, for essentially business travel that needs to go quickly. Um, and I think there's a lot of safety issues that they need to solve before that can happen, but uh, I think it will happen eventually. So I wouldn't be very surprised, no. you know, if that did happen eventually. I think um, at least within uh, the recent, you know, 10, 20 years, we've seen that technology really has grown tremendously, uh, like Dr. Liu had mentioned. But with something like, you know, business travel that takes like 40 minutes, if we were to go from New York to Asia, or just, you know, passenger flights, you know, going to space for fun. Uh, you know, there's also been concerns or talks about the environmental safety and just the impacts that can have on the environment of you know a lot of jet fuel the amount of energy and money and you know carbon waste that's produced from taking a spaceship and launching it into space uh even though i know jeff bezos has mentioned that through blue origins he was thinking that you know to help with the environment maybe some business would be conducted from space do you have any thoughts or comments on you know its possible influence you know on the environment and how that could potentially affect the way in which space and travel develops? Yeah, so the space travel industry right now is it's getting bigger, but it's not nearly as big as something like the air travel industry. So in terms of the absolute magnitude of its environmental effects, it's still relatively small. That being said, launching a single rocket does require a lot more fuel and energy than launching a single airplane. Um, and I think that as we look forward, the same processes that we use to say make renewable jet fuels um, will also be able to make renewable rocket fuels. So while we're in the process of making our other industries, especially air travel, but also things like sea travel and transportation in other ways, greener and more sustainable, I think those same technology developments will translate directly into making rockets the same way. Uh, Dr. Liu, did you have anything else you wanted to add to that? As with all technology, how we do it uh, is so important. It's all in the details. Right? It's very easy just to launch your rockets and then dump your, your stuff into the ocean and then whatever. Right? But it's also easy, although more expensive, to do it in a different way. And so I think what will happen is we need all of us collectively to have enough pressure on those who are developing this technology to tell them we care about the environment enough that we want you to spend the extra money, the extra time, whatever it takes to do it in a way that 
will be able to be sustainable in terms of our environment. This is true for everything now. And space travel is just one tiny example of all of that possibility. Air travel, tremendously uh, carbon heavy, right? Heating our homes, tremendously carbon heavy. Uh, all these things that are important and worth doing. But if it matters enough to us and we're willing to make that social uh, pressure toward the decision makers and the people who are doing stuff, it can be done. That's a really great message. And I think, you know, especially coming from, you know, all of us at the Macaulay community, there's always been such a strong belief that especially within uh, this generation, we understand that there can be many consequences to not taking that stance and giving these major companies that pressure because we understand that we'll still be here um, if anything were to happen by then. And kind of going back a little bit uh, to the Macaulay community, like I had mentioned, uh, Dr. Liu, you did spend quite a few years teaching uh, at the Macaulay community. And so now I'm wondering, because we're having such a great time and this discussion is, you know, I think it's very lively and not your stereotypical, um, very hardcore science where people may feel like they have a hard time to follow along with, or there are a lot of technical terms. Now, in what ways are you able to present science or physics in a fun and engaging way where students are able to understand and follow along with what's going on and not feel like they need to be stressed out to attend, you know, one of your lectures? What a great question. Hardcore science can be a lot of fun too. I mean, seriously, if you listen to Alan talking about four-dimensional polytopes and how you have mirror regular solids that extend out into like the time dimension and you have the warps and space, it's cool. It can be fun. Even hardcore science can be fun, right? Or, or film studies or media or whatever, right? I can imagine uh, somebody who's like, okay, I'm taking a gen ed film studies class. This is the 150th time we're talking about a movie and comparing it to Citizen Kane. What is the rosebud in, you know, John Wick Parabellum? Yeah, who knows, right? Um, it's all a matter of the delivery and understanding what matters most. I blame us scientists for making science class irritating, frightening, boring. See, we fall prey to this, oh, well, you know, I know this and I want to demonstrate how awesome I am. And so therefore this is what happens. Or we fall into the, well, this is how I learned it. And I went through this pain and suffering. So you should too, because it produced me and therefore the system is perfect, right? This is not correct. This is what we should not do. In fact, we should instead tell people how cool it is the stuff that we're actually doing, right? And then uh, you can decide how you want to approach it. I always tell people, if you don't like math, okay, don't blame the math, blame the math teacher, blame the math class, blame the math textbook, blame the math educational system that has put you in a circumstance where you cannot see the beauty and instead have to suffer through the slings and arrows of outrageous homework assignments that you feel are irrelevant. It was the teacher's uh, responsibility to tell you why it was relevant why it was awesome, why it was worth doing. Even if you don't get it right, it was still worth the effort, the attempt to do it. And if they can't do that, then you shouldn't have to do it, right? Um, that's sort of what it is. Uh, last spring, I taught a class in uh, what's called classical mechanics or engineering dynamics. Okay, this is like, differential equations, complicated, heavy stuff. And, and it's like, ooh, you know, how are you going to compute the Hamiltonian or the Lagrangian out of this and that? And, you know, it's fascinating and amazing and beautiful stuff. But when I was in college, that was my worst subject. I got the lowest grade in my entire college GPA in that classical mechanics class. And the irony, of course, is that years later, I wound up teaching it. Uh, so I had to ask myself, how do I make this so that the people who are taking it, regardless of what grade they get, understand that it's really cool. And so that's what we have to challenge ourselves as scientists every day. If I'm teaching science to a scientist or a future scientist or a future engineer or something like that, then I give them what they need to be excited about it so they can apply it in the future. If I'm teaching a general education science class or if I'm teaching seminar three, which by the way I am, uh, it, you wind up saying, don't worry about the math. 
do the best you can. Don't worry about them, but understand why we care. Try to learn a little bit about the statistics. Why do we need it? It's because we want to make sure we aren't fooling ourselves into doing irrational things or inappropriate things so that we will fall prey to those who seek to misinform us or otherwise manipulate us. If we understand the statistics, we are much better off in our own lives and for our entire society. That's the example of the kind of thing that I want to teach and how I teach it. Long-winded, but you got me going, so uh, that's the way it goes. Alan, I don't know, from, from your point of view, uh, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, get excited about stuff. Like, there are very few things that are inherently unexciting. I think it's just a matter of, of perspective. It's a matter of how you approach it, a matter of, of what mindset you bring to it and mind, mindset other people bring to it. And that's really the idea of, of doing things like having this book. Like, you, it's literally rocket science, but it's not difficult. Yeah, I, I completely agree with uh, what both of you had mentioned. And, you know, I, I have some personal experience um, working in the lab. And so I remember something that my mentor used to say, which was, your data and your results are only as important as you make it sound. So you can have groundbreaking news on cancer, um, but the way you bring that across the table to someone who's just going about their everyday life makes all the difference because you know, they need to be able to understand it and feel its importance to really care about it and make it exciting. And that kind of brings us to the transition of the children's book that uh, you published, um, Dr. Liu. So kind of along the lines of, you know, what motivated you to write this book? Because it is in a way a lot easier for, you know, everyone to read, of course, for children as well, which was your ta target audience. But, you know, what what made you decide that you were going to put this book out and what do you kind of hope that young children can take away from the book? Well, um, the reason I, I did this book is because I'm not a very good cook and I've always wanted to make something good for kids to eat. And so this is a, a very edible book. It's soft cover and you can munch it and you, and you know, get dog-eared corners and so forth. And while you're doing it, you get nutrition in the form of physics knowledge. Well, actually, it's, it's not exactly why I wrote the book, but I have always wanted to reach as many audiences as possible. When I was a, um, a parent of younger kids, that is when Alan and um, Hannah and Isaac, Alan's siblings, uh, were younger, I used to go and do fun after school stuff uh, in the elementary schools and, and tell people cool things and, and teach them uh, not so much facts, but ideas that they can then go forward in their lives. Because, you know, a kindergartner is not going to make a groundbreaking scientific discovery in this day and age in all likelihood. But if they know, right, that, for example, you can sing and dance about electromagnetic radiation, or you know how nuclear fusion works, and it's called the PP chain, you know, and, and things like that, uh, then it gets them excited and makes them happy. So that's always what I wanted to do. So when a publisher uh, called Callisto Press, Callisto Media, uh, came to me and said, hey, uh, do you want to write a little children's book? Like, like make it a really small thing, turn around, do it fast. Uh, and uh, you want to do it? And I said, yeah, let's give it a try. So that's, that's why it's happened. So Intro to Physics for Babies is your classic physics book. It's a story about a puppy uh, and a kitty cat and a little mouse and they all live in a little house together, no people at this moment, but there's a little story going on. And as they are acting out the story, they demonstrate the laws of physics, uh, specifically in this case, Newton's laws of motion and Newton's law of gravity. And then we talk about it and they have a great day and have fun and, and that's it. And, and then the editor on, on this book, uh, Janine, uh, was really great about storytelling and explaining how you might wanna do this. We wanna have this uh, narrative from the beginning, the beginning of the day to the end of the day and, and how these go on. And then just in case, uh, because it's likely that a parent will be reading this to a child. Um, there's a couple pages of slightly denser explanation, hopefully still clear and brief, but uh, more appropriate for the adults so that they know what they're seeing on the page and how it relates to the laws of motion and, and Newton's law of gravity. So that's what it is. 
Uh, it's just an extension of my desire to be a teacher. Uh, you know, who says that I have to teach only graduate students, right? That's wonderful that you were able to, you know, create a work of art that not only can someone who is in a graduate school level understand, but also has a much younger audience that could pick it up and understand, you know, why a puppy in motion tends to stay in motion. And was there a specific, you know, just out of so many topics and laws uh, that are within physics, was there a specific reason you chose to write it on um, Newton's law of motions? If there is one basic, simple thing, the first thing in every physics curriculum that you learn is about motion, is about Newton's laws of motion. Uh, every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction, right? Force is mass times acceleration. Uh, an object in motion tends to stay in motion, right? Object at rest tends to stay at rest. These are the things that everybody can know and quote and know physics. That's why it is, it's very simple. Also, uh, when a cat and a dog and a mouse are jumping around bouncing stuff, it's harder to talk about general relativity or quantum mechanics because most of those things are hard to see on the scale of little pets. But if you wanna see something move and then bump into a laundry basket and go poof, you know, that's Newton's law. Yeah, the book and the, the writing and the illustration, I think personally definitely makes it very easy for a young child to be able to see, you know, what's happening and you know, why did the puppy stop? Why did the cat start? And along with this writing process, you know, was it difficult or was it relatively easy for you to take these very important and key vital concepts within physics and really condense it down to, you know, very little words on a couple of pages to get this you know, the law of motion across for a child to be able to sit and read and understand, or you know, what was that like? Oh, um, every professor should know how to do that and, and revel in being able to do that. Uh, uh, one of my um, old friends, uh, a guy named Roger West, he's a retired chemical engineer. And I remember when Alan was in elementary school, maybe first grade or something like that. And, and Alan had some interests in, I can't remember what, what chemicals that you were involved it was in. hydrocarbons. Hydrocarbon, right. Um, <laughs> and I, you know, um, Roger is sort of um, at a grandparent age level. So a generation above me, basically. He graduated from college in the 1960s. Um, and, and, and here is this, you know, award-winning chemical engineer who had had a distinguished career, uh, done all kinds of cool things with hydrocarbons. And here's Roger explaining hydrocarbons to Alan, uh, an elementary school kid. Maybe even, were you in kindergarten even by then? I don't even remember, but it was amazing. Yeah, yeah. it was so inspiring. You know, so you realize that you know, Richard Feynman, Nobel Prize winning physicist, one of the pioneers of modern uh, particle physics, he used to like to say that if you really want to learn something, teach it to a kid. And so I guess what I was doing was just translating my knowledge into something else. Uh, physics, math, you know, chemistry, uh, all these things are just, uh, you, you can think about them as poetry or literature written in a foreign language, right? It's, it, it's not that people can't understand them, it's that you kind of should translate it for them. So I can't read French fluently, but if somebody has translated uh, Les Miserables or something, or some other great French novel effectively, then I would be able to enjoy it. That's my goal. That's how I approached it. And I said, if I'm a little kid and I like throwing things, and I like uh, watching things fall and run into other things and jumping on teeter-totters and, and swing sets and things like that, how do I use those tools and those metaphors to convey this really fundamental scientific stuff? Not in a way that impresses them, or, or makes them feel, wow, this is so hard, or, oh, wow, the author is so smart, but like, wow, this is really cool. I get it. What's next? 
that's what we're going for. That's really wonderful that, you know, I'm sure children being able to read this can have that excitement be sparked within them and kind of maybe push them in a direction where they're interested in learning about more science as they get older. And that really does have a big impact, especially on what children read when they are younger. And so, you know, I know now uh, we're approaching 651. And so I do want to open it up to our attendees who, if you have any questions for either Dr. Liu or for Alan, uh, please do go ahead and drop them in the chat box. I'm not sure if you are able to unmute yourself, but I'd be okay if you wanted to unmute yourself to ask a question as well. But if not, I'd be more than happy to help read out any questions that any of our attendees may have. There are actually two in the chat in the Q&A. Oh, perfect. Okay, let me pull that up. Okay. Uh, okay, so our first question says, on the topic of space, SpaceX and the like, the figureheads of these companies, Elon Musk, Jeff Bezos, are very controversial. While the technology is exciting, I'm absolutely pumped. Do you have any fears of space travel being abused? Yeah, I think it's it's some, going back to what Charles said regarding the environmental issues and stuff. It, it's the same dangers that we face with lots of different technologies. So something like you know, the internet, we know all the great ways that it's been used positively and some of the ways that it's been used negatively. And I think space travel, because it's such a powerful technology, has the potential to do the same. So for instance, one of the big controversies in the astronomical community with space flight right now is um, there are these new satellite internet constellations going up. Um, where they're sending thousands and thousands of satellites into very low orbits where they're gonna be very bright. Um, and it's going to make certain kinds of astronomical observations, for instance, looking at asteroids or planets around distant stars can really become very difficult because the, if you need a very broad field of view telescope for a, a very long time, the satellite trails are going to pass in front of the view of the telescope and make it very difficult to actually do your observations. Um, and so, while we continue to develop space travel as a technology, as an industry, we need to make sure that we're listening to concerns of lots of different people, whether that's people like astronomers who want to look at the sky or people who are maybe in communities that are being, like the Maldives almost got a rocket dropped on them by China um, because they uh, didn't properly dispose of one of the rocket boosters, unfortunately. America's done that in the past too, but we've been getting better at it over time. Um, and so there's these accidental effects and then there are more intentional effects. Like for instance, if someone tries to set up a surveillance network for a private company that will go and spy on people from space or if someone wants to do something ridiculous like put up space lasers. Um, like there, there are potentials for this technology to be used in negative ways, but I think that if we, as a, community, like focus our efforts to make sure that we are holding people accountable in space the same way we would on Earth, then I think that will enable us to move forward with space travel and avoid these abuses of power that could potentially come up from such our technologies. Dr. Liu, did you want to add to that? Well, let me just say that uh, right now, as of last year or so, there's a space force Right? Da, na, 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 we're in the Space Force. You know, uh, it's an actual, yeah, face palm. Sorry, Alan. Uh, it, it, it's a Space Force. It's, its mission is to cover uh, all the American defense interests from 100 kilometers or 60 ish miles up to infinity. Right? And so, there is now a military presence in space, and there always has been, although specifically putting weapons up in space has been, uh, by international agreement, not done. So with, with that in mind, we should always know that there are things that can, that can happen up there. Uh, and thank you for the person who asked this question, uh, that can be um, done poorly and be abused, as, as Alan was saying, very, very much so. Right. So um, I think it's important uh, to remember that the first rockets, as, as Alan says in, in some of at least one of your space race things, right, the, the, the very vehicles that brought humans into orbit and to the moon 
were descendants directly, technologically speaking, from the very same intercontinental ballistic missiles that are currently aimed all over the world with nuclear tipped warheads on them. So it is to humans, it is our society that constrains the technology to make it be serving us as opposed to causing our destruction. Okay, thank you. And Maya says that she thought uh, your theme song for Space Force is beautiful. And yeah, it's, it's based on the actual interim hymn of the Space Force. They have, it's a part of the John Philip Sousa March that they chose while they're writing an official song. <laughs> That's awesome. In, invincible something? The Invincible Eagles or Invincible yeah. Eagle or something like that. One Eagle, two Eagles? I think yeah. it's One Eagle. Okay. Eagle. Yeah, anyway, uh, uh, Alan came up with the words. So, but the, the tune you can actually hear, I believe there is a little snippet of it on the Wikipedia page for the US Space Force right now. You can hear what it sounds like. Uh, so uh, I, I think Alan's lyrics are great. We, we could all go out later by singing it together, right? Um, that would be a wonderful way to end. And kind of going uh, on to our next question uh, from Maya, she says, um, how did your education, education background as students and instructors shape your approach to the topics in your book? Well, let me, let me answer it real quick and then Alan, Alan should, should take that to the end because it's been a long time since I've been a formal student. Um, but I think as a kid, you always go, I wonder, blah, blah, blah. And so in many ways you're telling the story now, picking the topics in the book is really all about what do I want to learn and to share with people because it's cool in the context of the narrative from beginning to end of the book that you want to write. Yeah, I think one of the things that really I felt was, was fun uh, was the ability. So for each topic, there's sort of on the side, there's the guess, extension thing we call the landing section of the of the topic and you sort of get to add extra bonus information, whether it's like a fun little anecdote about something. Um, and I think that's just one of the things that I always appreciated as a student and later on as I've gotten into teaching and things like that as well, um, just to be able to say, hey, you know, while you're here, let's talk about the time that NASA took a rocket powered plane and flew it to space um, without actually intending to build a spaceship in the first place. They just sort of accidentally built a spaceship. So like that kind of thing, just bonus stuff, um, just to say, hey, you know, there's so much cool stuff out there. This is just a little taste of what you can expect. Dr. Liu, did you want to add to that as an educator? Well, uh, I'll tell you what, I definitely wanted to tell people stuff that was not in big, thick textbooks. That would be perhaps if I had to choose between two topics, I would prefer to choose the topic or describe the topic for a book like this uh, in a way that I knew that my students would appreciate as opposed to not appreciate. Um, this teaching thing, this educator thing. It's very much uh, a reaction and action back and forth between what you see is resonating with your students and what isn't. There's a core information that your course should have. It's like learning goals, right, in any syllabus. But how you present it to the students or the education target, whatever, it's a reader or whatever, how you do it depends very much on what the target audience is going to absorb or be able to or enjoy or otherwise uh, appreciate. So uh, my experience as an educator, especially at Macaulay, since all you all are highly motivated and, and very interested in what you're learning and so forth, right, has been uh, great. Uh, I have learned from my students what things matter to them and how things can be presented in a way that matters and is enjoyable and interesting without getting them scared or bored or otherwise unhappy. Uh, so that's how that has affected me. Yes, and I think from a student's perspective, we're really grateful when professors 
do take the extra effort to make the materials that we're learning very engaging and not something that's regurgitated, you know, from a textbook where we're probably going to be assigned to read anyways. So this brings us to 7 p.m., which right on the dot uh, is the conclusion of our event. So thank you so much, Dr. Liu and Alan. Let's try to answer that one more question. Can we do it in 30 seconds? Is that okay? Yeah. Okay, because yes. I, I don't want to, to let anybody down. Okay, uh, I'll go ahead and read it out loud. So it says, how do you address those who say that funding should be provided to issues like poverty, climate change, food insecurity, social justice issues, et cetera, and not space travel? Space can help with all that. That's how I would, my first initial response. Um, so things like climate change, we've had weather observing satellites since the beginning of the space race that have been tracking you know, global temperatures and the way that sea ice is changing and the sea level rise and stuff like that. For global poverty, we, we the same satellites are tracking food harvest outputs, are tracking the inputs to the natural environment that we can use to, to shape our world. And like space is, is, is just such a great resource that if your goal is to solve all of these social ills that we have here on the ground, then one of the best tools you can use in your arsenal for that is all the space assets that we have and, and continuing to expand into the universe. Alan's answer is perfect in this instance. Space travel might not change the price of bread today, but it could change and already has changed the course of civilization tomorrow. It's not an either or. Space travel, space exploration, space science is a key part to solving all those world's problems. That's it. Well, what I would like to say is to thank you, Dr. Liu, thank you, Alan, and to Anne, thank you so much for such an engaging discussion. And I just want, I know we're kind of out of time, but um, I will be bundling this all together for an audience member. So we'll do a random drawing and someone in the audience will get the two books. But you did make a great suggestion, Dr. Lou, that they will make great stocking stuffers. And we've been having a lot of alumni um, also doing book talks and their books are amazing as well. So look at our website. We do have some past events that were awesome as well. And I just wanna say good night to everyone and thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much. Thank you, Anne. Thank, thank you, everyone. Thanks, Alan. See ya.